Um, our, our next speaker, Sangju Zhang. Uh, Sangju and I go back a, a ways, and I, I was looking at his biography, and there's a, almost every stone that we're touch, touching the same thing here. He's the deputy director and senior fellow at the International Monetary Institute of Renmin University, uh, where I happen to be a senior advisor with, with Bob Mundell. Unfortunately, our, our third member passed away last year. Ron McKinnon was number three, a great man. And, and certainly in the spirit of every, everything we're doing here. Uh, the, the, the next stone where we're touching the same thing as the Johns Hopkins University. I'm director of the Institute for Applied Economics, Global Health, and the Study of Business Enterprise, which uh, was a sponsor, fortunately. Thank you, Jimmy, <laughs> for, for inviting us to be a, a sponsor with you for this conference. And Songju is a fellow at the Institute at, at Johns Hopkins. The next thing is the official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum, uh, founded by David Marsh in London. And uh, Sang Zhu is uh, on the advisory board. He actually is the vice chairman of the advisory board. I, I'm, I'm just on the advisory board, but we're still on the same stone there. And we're also on the board of directors of the Stern Stewart Institute in Munich. Uh, which is a, a German think tank. And uh, with that, let me just introduce you. By the way, the most important thing wasn't these stones. Th this is the man who has uh, translated uh, the collected works of Robert Mundell in Chinese. So, so, so he, and, he and Bob are tight. <laughs> Sanju. Thank you so much, Steve. Everyone, good afternoon. My great honor, pleasure to join this wonderful forum in honor of Jack Kemp and Bob Mondale. Well, you know, uh, I think Steve uh, expect me to talk about RMB and the story RMB and exchange rates. Yes, exchange rates these days always on the top list of. Uh, economic policies across the world, particularly for China in the past one decade. Actually, in the past two decades, mm -hmm. since 1994, China has two monumental reform of exchange rate regime. The first time is generally 1994, the so-called you know, uh, remove double exchange rates transform double exchange rate official and the market exchange rate into one official exchange rate with sharp depreciation from one po uh, from 5.5 .5 to 8.3 January 1994 since 1994 January to July 2005 RMB maintained absolute fixed exchange rate with US dollar 8.3. But since July 11, 2005, I think as it is possibly because of uh, the bashing pressure from US government, the Chinese government choose to depack RMB exchange rate with US dollar and let RMB flexible, more and more flexible. So the second big reform is July 11, 2005. Although Chinese government, PBOC, never said about the real reason, but I talked with uh, Governor Zhou several times. I, ask, I keep asking him, why did you choose to make RMB depegging with the US dollar and then let RMB flexible? His answer is very, very smart. Well, the central banker has only one model. That model is model through. 
We must solve problems. We don't have, uh, you know, the talk rates, theoretical framework to guide our action. Since then, I think the exchange rates is always one of top concerns of Chinese policies, particularly in the past two years after August 11, 2015, the first reform of exchange rate mechanism. And uh, you all know President Trump, during his campaign, he promised to label China as uh, many people later of exchange rate on his first day of in the White House, but he never lived to his promise. But after his summit with uh, President Xi two weeks ago in uh, Florida, Many people think, many Chinese people think the two guys made a great deal. So after the great deal, Trump, during his interview with, with the Wall Street Journal, he said he doesn't think China is uh, exchange rate manipulator. That's politician <laughs> wisdom, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, but since 2005, the second time of a big reform RMB exchange rate, I think PBOC as well as the Chinese government pursue two things. The first is more flexibility of exchange rates. I don't know why. I don't the reason, you know, uh, I said, Steve, you should know, the, uh, 1994 is also the first year Bob Mondale visited China visit PBOC and join the PBOC uh, for a conference. But since then, Bob Mondale Bob visited China almost 100 time, times. But he always, he always opposed, at least skeptical, of any step of uh, you know, reform toward flexible exchange rates. Since the year of 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, every year Bob Mondale joined so many conferences in China and supports the Chinese argument against the U.S. government to uh, push RMB exchange rate to depreciate, to, to appreciate, to be flexible. But Bob Mondale last, last September he write down uh, several words to explain his uh, disappointment about movement of RMB exchange rates. So that's the, that's the first thing the government PBOC pursue. The second is the so-called international use. We, use, we scholars use internationalization, but the PBOC, the central bankers, officials, never use internationalization, they use international use or uh, cross-border use of RMB. I don't know why, but there is a very delicate reason to you know, uh, lower down the profile of uh, their ambition. So I will talk about uh, very briefly uh, the latest developments of RMB internationalization and uh, exchange rate uh, management. So one landmark, the landmark is, oh, sorry, is landmark is uh, IMF welcome RMB inclusive uh, SDR baskets. And uh, in terms of uh, shares of baskets, RMB now is the second important currencies just next to Euro and the US dollar. And of course, inclusion of RMB into the basket of his SDR creates so much pressure for our central bankers because we made a promise to open up at least gradually the capital account. Of course, Governor Joe emphasized again and again, our capital account convertibility is not fully convertibility, it's the so-called Managed convertibility. Steve, Professor Liu, I don't know how to define the managed 
It's a new word. In, in, in the workability of IMF, managed convertibility. So government do emphasize again and again, well, we should insist on managed convertibility. However, you can see here, after, after depreciation, sharp depreciation, since August 11, uh, 2015, the so-called pace of internationalization of RMB has slowed down, slowed down sharply. And we calculate, we invent an index. My institute invented index, international index declined significantly after depreciation. So now, the index is only 3.24, and the highest point is 3.96. And uh, compared with uh, these currencies, of course, US dollar is number one, euro, and the pound, yen, the four currencies in terms of uh, extent of interna international use or internationalization, all these currencies are far, far advanced than RMB. So RMB is, a, is still far behind dollar and the euro. What's the driving force? First of all, trade settlements is still the most important driving force for international use of RMB. Look at these figures. And last year, trade settlement volume declined very, very significant compared with the last, uh, the 2015. 2015 is uh, 7.7 .7 trillion. Here is only 5 trillion. And, and now, RMB trade settlement account for, well, 27% of total Chinese trade and uh, account for 3% of a total world trade. So trade settlement by RMB is, uh, has already been very, very important for Chinese trade because our neighbors, particularly our neighbors, the countries in the one belt, one road, and more and more our partners choose to uh, settle their trade with China by uh, RMB. But with the uh, US, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Europe, with the uh, developed countries, most of the uh, trade are still settled by US dollar and uh, Europe. So second driving force is the so-called international financial transaction. That means credit, bond issue, FDI, or uh, Chinese investment overseas by uh, individual investors as well as uh, companies, or become more and more important in these years, particular after the PBOC and other regulators list the so-called limit and the quota for uh, you know, Q fee, uh, RQ fee, and other investments uh, 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 vehicles. So more and more. Uh, investors, both domestic and international investors, uh, prefer to use RMB to do their investments. And the now Chinese investors has already become the second largest uh, cross multinational or cross border investors. And uh, they, of course, they prefer to use RMB to, to invest overseas. But now the total amount is, is, uh, is still very small, but uh, keep increasing. And uh, swap, the second driving force, the third driving force is, uh, is a carry swap, uh, the, the, the agreement by PBOC and other uh, central bankers. Uh, right now, the total amount is uh, roughly 3.3 uh, .3 trillion RMB, 3.3 trillion RMB. So, IMF made announcements, RMB now account for more than 1% of the worldwide foreign reserve. 
according to the IMF uh, statistics. So in, in this direction, particular after financial crisis uh, 2008, you know, the Chinese officials, even the president, the premier, expressed their, their opinion many times. They uh, don't like they don't like the so-called dollar dependence. And the governor Joe published a quite famous paper in the uh, in, uh, year of 2009 to propose you know, the so-called SDR to become the anchor currency of international monetary order to replace at least partly US dollar. And the Premier Li Keqiang, he expressed, I remember again and again many times during uh, the, the important international conference with, uh, with, uh, during his uh, meeting with uh, foreign uh, government leaders, he worried about the so-called dollar dependence. So I think that's the real reason why things the year 2009 PBOC and the Chinese government, you know, encourage encourage the so-called trade settlement by RMB and the RMB direct investment overseas and the foreign invest investors investment into China using RMB. So I think that's the internationalization of RMB. The real reason I think maybe is ambition of of Chinese Chinese leaders to replace partly. U.S. dollar, of course, one belt, one road initiative. Next month they will summit. The foreign minister announced twenty-eight premiers and uh, state leaders will join the summit in Beijing. And one belt, one road initiative has at least one goal, that is to promotes cross-border use of RMB. And the AIIB, of course, AIIB also wants to promote the use of RMB, the investment infrastructure in, in these areas. So I think in this direction, we had made a little bit uh, progress. Uh, some people think, well, it's a great achievement, particularly in terms of uh, trade settlement, but in terms of uh, financial transaction, the achievement is not very impressive, but trade settlement is very, is very uh, impressive. However, the second issue is the change rates. Of course, the very close relevant to international use of RMB, right now we are facing challenges, three big challenges. So first, you know, so-called trilemma. That's a key idea Bob Mondell to analyze the international finance. So you should ask me what's the top priority of a PBOC or a state council. I myself sometimes must guess even though I'm very close to uh, uh, deputy governors, even governor. Now uh, three deputy governors of a PBOC are my close ma classmates, very close friends. Sometimes I ask them, what's your focus point of your policy right now? Well, PBOC never announce their objective or policy framework. So that's why Governor Joe told me, we have one model, model through. <laughs> but my guess is, you know, our leaders, they want everything. That's the problem. They want exchange rate stability, okay? They want to maintain or increase the foreign reserve money. They worry about the decline of foreign reserve. 
you know, by the end of uh, 2015, our reserve money is almost 3.9 trillion US dollar. But in one and a half year, decreased by more than one trillion. They worry about the threshold and right now is a three trillion. If decline the past the threshold of three trillion, they worry about well, maybe we'll cause some panic. So they want stable foreign reserve money, even increase of foreign reserve. And of course they want independent monetary policy. So how can we manage the trade dilemma, dilemma? Three days ago, three days ago, Wall Street Journal has a one page, very long article to talk about how Chinese manage the trade dilemma. So if you choose the ability of exchange rates, okay, you want independent monetary policy, of course you need to control the capital account. So that's the current choice. Particular, Steve, particular before the 19th Congress of the Communist Party, before the Congress, the, 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 the 19th Congress of the Communist Party, the keywords of any policy it's stability, okay? The president will, you know, strengthen his power further. So before Congress, everything must be very, very careful. And the stability is the key word for any policy. So this year, I think the PBOC, and the city council will choose the, the stability of exchange rate foreign reserve money, and at least they will sacrifice a little bit independence of monetary policy. So I think that's my uh, best guess, my best guess. Not easy, of course, to stabilize exchange rates. My classmates working in, uh, in the PBOC Sometimes privately they, they uh, complain with uh, they complain uh, Fed U.S. Fed policy, and uh, they 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 told uh, officials the Treasury officials and the Fed officials, you ask us to stabilize exchange rates. You threaten to enable us as um, exchange rate manipulator. But you know, the RMB exchange rates is influenced so significantly by your policy, but you never consult us when you change your policy. I think that's a right complaint. And uh, since, since last year, every year we'll have a dialogue the very high level dialogue between PBOC and the Federal Reserve. I remember last year in Hangzhou, uh, more than 30 senior officials from Federal Reserve, uh, Federal Reserve headquarters uh, and, uh, and the New York Fed to join the dialogue. A very, very productive, very, very good dialogue. And so during the two days meetings, we exchange opinions and so we complain each other. I think that uh, demonstrates we need coordination, cooperation of uh, monetary policy, particularly between or among the big economies. <coughs> However, right now, the PBOC must model through itself. So, not easy. Because why? As you all know, Exchange rate depreciation, the pressure of RMB depreciation doesn't come from management of policy, doesn't come from management of foreign reserve or so-called reforming of uh, exchange regime, come from the real economy. 
The price is in a barbell in the real estate market. The prices of uh, so many commodities, products, services are much, much higher than here. So I know, personally I know, so many Chinese individual investors, companies, rush to transfer money outside to buy something, to buy property here, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, UK. I think that's the pressure of depreciation. How can we contain such pressure? So now we tighten control. We never use the control. Capital control is a bad word. We never use the capital control. We use the new words, prudential. <laughs> <laughs> prudential <laughs> regulation, OK? That's very good. That's uh, from uh, Walker Bueller of IMF. So IMF is a great inventor of new words. <laughs> it's good words. So now we, 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 we don't talk about capital control. We talk about improvements of uh, management, prudential, uh, regulation, surveillance. But, you know, but certain change, not China, is domestic financial risks. Look at, after, you know, flexible exchange rate become more and more flexible, and so uh, we lift the control of capital flows. Chinese domestic financial markets has more and more close connected with the foreign uh, international fi uh, financial markets. And the risks, you know, here since, since the, f the first time of uh, re reform the change to the last year, we have survived the seven major shocks. That's a reform, that's a subprime crisis, there's a financial crisis globally. There's a the liquidity shortage. There's a RMB depreciation. There's a, you know, uh, stock markets uh, turbulence uh, middle 2015. So I think domestic risks, domestic financial risks has become obvious and great and greater. So the top concern, absolutely top concern, right now for Chinese economy is how to manage or can we manage the financial risks originated from a so high leverage ratio of local governments as well as non-financial companies. That's of course, I just mentioned it's also key reason for RMB to depreciate, the pressure to depreciate. So I think in this sense, the PBOC will change its policy from this year, at least partly. This means PBOC will not loosen its money supply or credit creation further. You know, the leverage ratio for non-financial companies average in China is almost, you know, uh, three times of, of uh, U.S. companies and the two times, more than two times of uh, Japanese companies. More and more companies cannot so service payments of principal and interest. So that's, uh, that's a very worrying single. The third challenge, of course, is uh, transforming the growth model. The growth model, I th I th I th basically, we, the, the growth rate is a decline further and further. Uh, 2015 is 6.9, uh, is, uh, last year is 6.7, uh, and this year premier setup, the target is roughly 6.5% uh, about. But first quarter, of course, is a big surprise. It's 6.9% uh, just because of uh, infrastructure investments increasing so much in the, in, the, in the first quarter this year. 
But many people believe second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, the GDP grow, growing will decline maybe sharply because of uh, the private investment is uh, still very, you know, very, very slow. And consumption is not very strong. And export, export last year is a negative 2%. But this year, we don't expect it will become net positive. It will be also negative. It declined. So uh, take account of all those three driving force forces. The GDP growth will, will decline further. And uh, of course, uh, for any currency to become real international currency, I think there are three preconditions. First is a large scale innovative economy. Second is a deep financial market. The third is a good governance rule of law. But for large scale, yes, we meet. Second, partly we meet. Third, we only partly meet, still less. So for RMB to become real international currency, we have much, much things to issue to deal with, so many things to do. It's a long way to go. So I remember Bob, Bob Mondale in China always emphasized if things is okay, why do you want to change? And uh, before 2005, 2005, the year of 2005, the Bob Mondale met with the Premier Wen, Wen the former Premier Wen Jiabao, and uh, he told Premier Wen, your exchange regime is good for your growth. Don't change it. Don't change it. Since it's okay, why do you want to change? But in the past one decade, we changed it more and more flexible. I don't know it's good or bad. There's no strong empirical evidence to support the flexibility of RMB. Of course, PBOC governor and other scholars write so many papers to support the reform. Personally, I always oppose the reform. I talk about talk these issues with so many people. They cannot give me a very strong, convincing argument to support the flexibility of exchange rates. But now we cannot come back. I cannot come back. So after 19th Congress this autumn, I predict, I predict the exchange rate RMB will become more and more volatile. And then they will net RMB depreciate, maybe depreciate to 7.3, even 7.5. Otherwise, you must uh, allow the foreign reserve money to decline. So I think the priority for, for uh, top leaders, they won't have foreign reserve money. They don't want to sacrifice so much foreign reserve money to defend exchange rates. But after Congress, after this year, maybe RMB will resume a momentum of depreciation. I don't know, that's my best guess. Thank you. Okay, we'll start. Thanks. Um, you didn't give us your ultimate conclusion about where RMB internationalization is, is headed. I, I wanna get a better understanding of whether you think we're in a pause phase or whether you think it's over. Let me just brief you, briefly give you the case for the opposition why I think it may be over for good. Um, between 2005 and 2013, virtually every year, 
the RMB appreciated, 37% in total. Um, I would argue that part of the RMB's appeal as an international currency was speculative, that it appeared to be a permanent one-way bet. But of course, since then, we've seen a 13% depreciation in the RMB. So that speculative element is gone, and I would argue will never come back. Um, two, um, Chinese um, exports as a percentage of total exports was on a relentless climb. From 1980, it was 1%. By 2014, it was 14%. Since then, it's actually declined. And if you go back to 2014, no one was actually predicting that. Um, third, globalization itself is in retreat. And of course, the, the rise of China is intimately related to globalization factors. Generally, since the financial crisis, capital flows are well down, trade barriers are up, merchandise trade is down for the first four-year period since the Second World War. That's a big deal. Um, and finally, China simply doesn't have the depth of financial markets to support a global RMB. Right now, the RMB represents less than 2% of global reserves. I did my own calculations. Let's say, you remember Australia a few years ago decided to boost its um, uh, the RMB composition of its reserves to 5%. Yep. So I did my own math. If everyone in the world decided to hold just 5%, RMB, RMB 5% of global foreign exchange reserves, foreign official institutions would control almost one-third of the Chinese sovereign debt market. To put that in perspective, the U.S. dollar is about 63% of global reserves, and foreign official institutions control 36% of U.S. Treasury debt, meaning ch the Chinese sovereign bond market would have to expand astronomically in order just to match um, the euro. So there's the case for the opposition. So I want to I hear your, your perspective. Well, yes. Uh, you are right. You know, the previous years, the international use of RMB depends at least partly the one side appreciation. So after August 11, 2015, the reform depreciation caused, you know, sharp decline of index, internationalization index. Looking forward, particularly in two years, even three years, considering our economy, financial market, particular short market, bond market, I don't think in terms of these measurements, I don't think internationalization of RMB will uh, increase further. Ten years' time. Ten years' time, well, depending on, well, depending on opening up of our financial market. Of course, now we are, we are doing things is to strengthen the Chinese financial market, particularly to strengthen regulations. In terms of uh, uh, outstanding volume, uh, the bond market, the Chinese bond market right now is a, is a fourth. Some, some people think it's a, it's a third, the biggest bond market. And the stock market is, uh, yes, it's a third or fourth, the largest market in the world. So if we can improve our regulation surveillance, and uh, Governor Joe promised two years ago, we will limit, we will remove all limits, all quotas, uh, Q fee for foreign investors. So in, if that's the case, I think the cross-border use of RMB will increase uh, progressively in, in, the, in the next years. But the key issue is capital account. You know, many foreign investors keep complaining and they write letters, uh, open letters on a website to complain because of uh, the tightening control, they cannot transfer money outside. So at least part, some of them, become very, very reluctant to invest in China. That's the issue. I think officials say that PBOC, they are very smart. They are very smart. They, are, they know 
the complaint by foreign investors, so they will change. So capital accounts liberalization is a key issue for, for internationalization of RMB. And I don't know when we will realize the so-called managed convertibility. But not only no, no, we have already a managed convertibility, but people think we should have a fully convertibility. So it takes time, maybe five years, to fully convertibility. So yeah. I, I want to squeeze two more questions in here, and then we're going to move on. So Warren. Uh, Warren Coates, Re recalling the uh, governor of the PBRC's 19, or 2009 pl statement about increasing the use of the SDR to replace dollars in international reserves, but plus the, the push by China to increase cross-border use of the renminbi, which I, I think was politically motivated by getting into the SDR valuation basket, but either, either way, you know, uh, a desire to increase use of renminbi or, uh, or uh, replacing the dollar with the SDR internationally fly in the face of the choice of the U.S. dollar as the unit for the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. That just floored me. You know, I mean, they're operating on the basis of dollars, denominating the dollars. What's going on? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, 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 the president of uh, AIB, Jin Yi Qin, uh, made the remarks that issue. I think he said it's a consensus of members. And of course, it's convenient. But they welcome the members <coughs> invest AIB using RMB. Or other currencies. If China had pushed for the SDR, which these countries are used to doing with yeah. the IMF anyway and the World Bank and so on, I'm sure they would not have objected. But but PBOC always supports the use of SDR. And uh, State Council State Council of PBOC uh, very uh, active or uh, to issue SDR denominated bonds. And uh, to, one week ago, the, the vice president of World Bank visited PBOC, talk about maybe they jointly issue SDR denominated bonds. So, okay. I, but, uh, but the problem is that the total amount of the SDR is, uh, is too small. Compared with a U.S. dollar reserve, it's almost zero. It's almost zero. Last question, Judy. Um, this is so fascinating, and, and your <laughs> insights are so helpful. I'm just wondering, totally hypothetical, but let's say on day one of the Trump presidency, he had followed through with, say, an executive order asking his Treasury Secretary to declare China a currency manipulator. Now, there was a problem. He didn't have a Treasury Secretary. That took a few more weeks. And then he wanted to speak with, with Xi Jinping. He wanted to speak with him, and then he did speak with him. At some point, what would, what would China have done? And, and I don't mean in terms, because we're talking about trade and the impact of, of exchange rates. And, and of course, it could be retaliatory tariffs, if that's what it amounted to. But what I'm thinking, what could China do? If, if the definition of manipulation was doing the daily fix on the, on the RMB and the dollar, if China were to then say, OK, we'll stop, then the US would have to ask what it was wishing for, no? <laughs> <laughs> no, and, but I don't see how you could stop. Wouldn't it send a bad signal if it started to depreciate? And you, you couldn't put on stronger capital controls. Uh, Wouldn't capital very flee? good question, yes. Very good hypothetical question. I, to my knowledge, Chinese governments made preparation for the possible Trump's announcements to label China as a, as a manipulator. But China 
emphasized action, not words. Even U.S. government allows you a manipulator. We will say, what you will do? Because manipulator will become an excuse for U.S. to launch the trade investigation, even trade war. If that's the case, to my knowledge, the Ministry of Commerce has made preparation to retaliate. If you launch the trade dispute investigation, even trade war, definitely China will retaliate. They prepare list of retaliation. But it wouldn't, wouldn't change your behavior with respect to managing the exchange rate? You are right. They, they will adjust the management of uh, capital accounts. Capital accounts. And uh, more importantly, I don't know, there is no uh, uh, news release during the summit, President Trump and the President Xi. And uh, foreign report is Chinese promise to net US financial institutions to do more business in China. This means China will open financial market more to US financial institutions. That's part of Leo. If that's the case, you hypothetical case, I think China will close or will a little bit more to US financial institutions and the service companies, service industries. That's uh, some measures of, of uh, retaliation. Since China started the peg in 1994, no U.S. administration has ever wanted a floating RMB. At the height of the Asia crisis in May 1998, yeah. Treasury Secretary Bob Rubin said, and I quote him, in maintaining its exchange rate policy, China is an island of stability in a sea of turbulence. <laughs> we were very grateful. <laughs> Dr. Song Chu, thank you very much. <laughs>